Welcome, everyone, to this live broadcast of Manufacturing Talk Radio. I'm Tim Grady. I'm here with my co-host, Lou Weiss, who's the founder of Manufacturing Talk Radio. It's the first week of the month and the first business day. We're getting into the ISM report. And we have Tim Fiore, who is the committee chair from the Institute for Supply Management, joining us to dive into the details of the report. Tim, again, thanks for being with us. Yeah, good to be here, Gus. So as we noticed the number tailing off, which we expected, we didn't, uh, we'd have been surprised if it popped suddenly above 50. So uh, give us a rundown of what the numbers are showing behind the number we hear on usually on mainstream media. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of high end stuff uh, for the last four or five months, I've been predicting a 48 to 52. No reason why not. We fell below that for the first time, 47 and some change. Okay. I still think we're in a 48 to 52 environment. I, and, and there's many things that can happen here that would support that. So um, secondly, you know, the, the profile on this cycle is very similar to the profile that we had in 2019, uh, although it's a finer ups and downs. So the, the, the decline in 2019 was deeper ups and downs. So it kind of indicates that we're coming down slowly. And in the last 12 months, we've lost about 10 points on the PMI. Uh, so th we're coming down about a point a month, which is really gradual, slow. So and I, I think that's a positive thing, too. We, we're not seeing any drastic change. So, you know, I like to talk about this thing in terms of demands, uh, outputs, and, and inputs. What's, what's really missing, uh, clearly, is on the demand side. There's a 42 and a half on a new order number. It's pretty weak. Now, our seasonal adjustment factors in January didn't mark up the new order number as much as it did in December. So if you strip those out, it's very similar. They're very similar numbers. Okay, but when are buyers and, and sellers going to re get together and and reload the order books? Uh, I'm still waiting. Uh, prices are coming down. Lead times are stuck, and which could be part of the issue. I've been talking about it now for four or five months. But let's stick on the demand piece. So the new order number is really weak. That's the primary reason that we fell below the 48 for sure. New export orders see some is seeing some amount of life. We almost hit 50 for the first time in quite some time. And there was a lot of good comments about China reopening up and orders coming in from China and a lot of comments about Europe still being sluggish. So I don't know that we're going to see a huge change there, but I would think that China will continue to open up. So that new export uh, order number should jump up in the low 50s uh, by the time we get to the uh, end of February. So that's a positive. Europe's going to be totally different. The customer inventory number, it's at the low end of just right, which or at the high end of too low, whichever you want to call it. But it's moving in the right direction, and that is down. We want that number driven down. I want to see it below 40 again. When it was below 40, I felt really good. So, okay, at least it's not growing. It's not. We're not too high. Remember, we're trying to get rid of all this excessive ordering, all this material that we had flowing, all the promises and commitments. We're trying to, and that's why the new order number is down, because nobody wants to add to the order books that they don't need to at present. So the third one here is backlog. I mean, we were... We were 40, I think it was in, uh, let's see, back, we were 41.4 in December, 40 in November. We're at 43.4 now. Okay, signs of life. So the backlog's not as contracting as, as fast as it was, which is a, another positive thing. All right, so that's on the demand side. We need, we need people to get back, work out stuff, get agreements, and, and move on. So again, you know, top level. So I think I mentioned to your, I actually have a slide. Would you like me to put a slide up? Sure. Absolutely. All right, hold on. Let's see if I can get it up. Let's see here. All right, let's see. Share. Okay, you seeing this? Yeah. Absolutely. Looks good. All right, hold on. Um, okay. Okay, so I've been tracking uh, the contraction. In other words, how much, of, how much percent of the industries are contracting? And how many are contracting at 45 or less? Now... You know, at 43 or less, I'd be really alarmed. So I, I picked 45, two points above 43. We start getting, you know, a huge amount under 45. That's a real cost for concern. But, you know, it's, it's that is a cost of concern versus uh, an industry sector that's contracting at 49.5. Big difference. So here's the, here's the trend since, since September. September, October, 8% were below, uh, equal to or below 45. You can see we went from 30% to 64%. Overall, we're now sitting at 86% of manufacturing is contracting, but only 26% is contracting 
at 45 or less, an improvement from December is 35%. The single biggest reason there is uh, chemical products. Chemical products was close to 40. It's now above 45. It's not quite at 50, but it's showing some signs of life. And th that is one of the industry sectors to really watch because everybody needs a chemical somewhere, whether it be corrugate, whether it be adhesives, fabrics, you name it. Uh, chemi basic chemicals, intermediate chemicals, plastic resins, they're all in that bucket. And, and they're, they're well down in the tiers on the bill of materials. So it, everybody's demand tends to aggregate with the chemical guys. So when the chemical, I'm watching chemicals to see that thing get back above 50. And that would be almost like transportation, meaning that things are definitely getting better. We're seeing it at the foundational um, categories. But I think this is really important is that chemicals recovered a bit. Uh, and that's resulted in fewer of, uh, of the percent of industry segments contracting below 45. There, let me shut that off. Let's go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. Let me let me let me show another one. Ah, okay. Hold on a sec. I talked to this, but uh, let's see. Share. All right. Let's get to this one. No, oh, oh, no. Okay. Can you see that? We do. Okay. So you guys have seen this chart before. <laughs> I keep track of the uh, the PMI indexes. And, uh, and and I track the, the one that crosses the 50 line both ways on the way up and the way down. So you can see the last expansion, we're sitting at 47.4. You can see that last expansion came down pretty smoothly compared to the one before that. The slopes on both of those numbers, last expansion and the uh, the, the Trump-Obama expansion, are very similar on the climb down. And, and the climb down with the last expansion was simply running out of gas, uh, and maybe to some extent tariff headwinds, but it was really just running out of gas. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. Although what's happened is, is that you know, we have the Federal Reserve raising rates. That is, you know, it's another anxiety for sure. But it's almost like we're running out of gas. It's a slow decline. We're losing about a point every month. Uh, we've come down about 10 points in the, in the last 12 months. So, you know, it's not, we're not getting slammed into a recession. It's a, it's a gradual come down. So, and I, and I think- yeah, go ahead. I'm still seeing the contraction analysis. Oh, geez. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes, now. Yeah. Now I now I see the uh, PMI 2003 to 2023. Okay. Good. Perfect. Okay. So you can kind of see it here. Let's see if I can get my pointer on. Okay. This slope right here. This is 2019. And this is the you know the current decline that uh, we cross cross the line in uh, November, we're third third month below the line here. They're very similar, but you can see we had some you know significant jaggeds here, ups and downs, ups and downs. We not we're not having that here. There's fewer teeth, which means we're very close. The numbers just gradually coming down. So the other thing that's important here is that we were below this 50 line for probably about six months. We kind of started to come up, and then the pandemic hit. You look over here, about six months here, in the silent expansion and the expansion, again, about six months. This one's a little longer, but it was a little bit fuzzier, too, because you got ups and downs. So you could argue that we're probably going to sit below 50 here for another three months and then start to grow out. And there's there's some interesting commentary that uh, the panelists provided me with uh, this month. So let me, let me jump into the output side, production and employment. So we've been watching employment. It's another one of the big indicators. We've been running two to one, hire to force manage for four months, which means for every three companies that are commenting on the employment section, two of them are hiring and one is freezing or trading or laying off. In the month of November, we had the first significant signs of layoffs. I think it was 14% of the comments indicated they're laying off. In December, that slowed to seven. And we thought it was probably because of the holiday period. But you know now we're actually below seven in January. But now that ratio is four to one. So uh, for every five companies, four are hiring. Only you know, 20% of the respondents are managing their headcount. That's an improvement from 35% in the prior month. So there's a sign here that the panelists' companies are going to try to, to get their way through uh, probably half one, just like our forecast indicated back in November, that half one would be a challenge, be more difficult, 
half two is going to recover significantly better than half one. And if you're going to do that, you better have the manpower. The Joel's report came out today, still 11 million people, uh, 11 million job openings, and only you know half the people on you know, 6 million or something, five and a half are in the unemployment rolls. That number is still staying there. We've been fighting for two plus years to add to our headcount. I think you know prudent business people are saying, hey, we see we got some bumps here, but it's not worth it to lay the people off and rehire them back in, in April and May. Let's make it through. If we can make it through profitably without you know big brackets on our earnings, which which kind of says we've been successful in passing price increases through, and there isn't any indication that we're going to have to give it back and squeeze our margins even more. Let's hold on to this headcount and get through at least Q1 to get closer to the half two, and we'll make the decision then. So I think that's a positive from from my standpoint. That may not be positive from the Federal Reserve standpoint because I think they're they're really looking at you know, a, a collapse in demand, which would reflect a reduction in headcount, and the people that come off the payrolls can't spend money because they don't have it, uh, which then supports the collapse in demand again. So I'm not sure they're they're going to be really happy about this, but from the standpoint of supply and demand, it kind of feels good. Within the last month, All Metals and Forge Group has run uh, ads for uh, sales, outside sales, inside sales and uh, some administrators. And I have never seen such a worse collection of people and numbers of people applying for jobs. I mean, we've gotten in the last month, two. And we went on a couple of the uh, recruitment programs we actually are running ads on our All Metals and Forge Group uh, website, and uh, it's really pretty pitiful. Uh, December was better when you would normally think that no one leaves a job in December because they wait for their Christmas bonus. Then they quit on January 2nd, and that's I'm not seeing that. Yeah, yeah, so... You know, I've been tracking the difficulty to hire. Yeah. And uh, you know, back in November, 27% of the hiring comments explained that it was difficult to hire. That mm -hmm. dropped to 5% in December. But we had a relaxation in hiring, too, to some extent. And it's back at 14% of the comments, difficulty in hiring. So it hasn't gone away. We had a lot of retirements in January, a lot of comments around people retiring, they're gone, and, and they're going to be backfilled, they're going to be replaced. Uh, the quits rate jumped back up again. I mean, in uh, November, we had 26% of the comments where people were quitting, turnover, uh, down to 19% in December. Again, that's that point that you made, Lou, about who's going to leave in December. And we also had the uncertainty about what January is going to look like. Remember, if you're the last one in being hired, you're the first one out, yeah. you're going to get let go. So, uh, you know, on the back, we're back at 21%. So we still got this, we got this turnover back. It's still continuing. So, um, yeah, we had 23% of the comments indicate on the employment side that things were improving. That's up from 5% in December. So, okay. But, you know, getting the highest quality people and getting enough candidates to make it kind of work is remains a challenge. I mean, the JOL support is, is great for 11 million open jobs, only 5.5 million on the unemployment rolls. How are you going to fix this? a bartender and a tire salesman. I, I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> So, Tim, I'm just wondering, you've covered the demand side. Uh, give us the, you know, what's the supply side look like? We've talked for months and months about supply chain disruptions and so on. Uh, how's that side deal? You know, so we've had what, three straight months now of suppliers delivering faster. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for that to stop. To at least hit 50, 51, 52, it's, it's unusual to have that kind of a run on suppliers delivering faster. So, you know, I, I, there's a couple things on there. The supplier delivery number is very low. Uh, I, I'm surprised it's still not, it's not 50. We're still contracting at 45. And maybe more importantly, the inventory number at 50.2. With all this extended supply chain stuff and all this over and the perceived lack of uh, demand and the, the weak output, you'd think manufacturing inventory would go up. It's not. It's 50.2. Now, that could be an overhang from 2022. You know, we'll see what February brings. But... I think both of those numbers are prime candidates to help that PMI get back above 50. To get the supplier delivery number to 52, 
get the uh, manufacturing inventory number to 52. That's a huge change in the number. So I, there's, uh, 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 in terms of delivering faster, I think we're 89% are delivering faster, the same or faster in January than they were in December. But that's following three or four straight months of over 80% improvement. So that's going to be an early indicator that things are happening. Just like chemical products is an early indicator of things happening in the industry sector, the supplier delivery number getting more attention is going to be a good indicator too. Uh, the other thing, I'm, one of the other things, I'm, I'm watching five significant things here to see when things start to move. One of them is transportation costs and availability. And it's not, they're not issues. They're still not issues. They weren't in, in December. They weren't in November. They're still not issues. When they become issues, whether you know the spot price goes up or there's lots of comments around having difficulty getting carriers to show up, then that's another indicator because that's another aggregator industry that everybody has to access like, like chemicals. So uh, yeah, so hey, the, the supply chain is poised to respond to demand. When factory output, or new orders support a factory output of 55, 56, the supply base will is in a position to respond for the first time in what, three years? Yeah. Yeah, all of that. Uh, imports and exports, how are they holding up? The new export order number I was very happy with. I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the demand side, but we're getting close to 50. 49 is some change. Uh, could very well be now in January we're going to get above 50, which would be really good. That has got to be helpful to the new order number. Um, and, and the comments supported the fact that China's reopening. But, you know, it's a, it's a bumpy reopen because there's a lot of sickness out there. So there's a lot of absenteeism kind of like what we had with Omicron a year ago. So it'll it'll take three, four months for that to, to kind of normalize. But now that they're back at work, uh, no, there's demand in the US for placing orders with us. Europe is sluggish, even though the report came out that the uh, GDP grew in Europe in Q4, I think it was last year. Uh, you know, their, their, their real viability and, and strength is, is very weak. I think we're all a bit euphoric that, you know, they haven't had an energy problem this year. And that's really good. We'll see what happens next year. But uh, yeah, new exporters, imports. Uh, there were some comments that because of the China situation, that uh, there were some loads that didn't make the, the the birthing spot and get on the ships and get sailing before the Lunar New Year. So we'll see what that means. I mean, I can imagine if everything was bumpy over there and people were sick, the transportation networks were unreliable. Uh, you know, even, even the ship dockings probably were and the loading and unloading. So we'll see what that leads to. That remember, that's kind of what started our whole problem on uh, supply chain disruptions three years ago. Is you know the, the ship shipboard stuff that then got backed up in the ports and the drayage and all that. So that might be the first early early indicator that things are responding and the ports start to back up. But at present, there's no no port issue. There's no tra no transportation issue. Well, there, there there is one particular port issue that could throw this whole thing up in the air, and that's Taiwan and China. And the prediction of some four-star general on our side who said, we're going to war the end of February. So that could change things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that would be a really bad thing. Bad, bad, bad. Yeah, it'd be really bad. Yeah, I don't think that helps anybody's economy, uh, particularly with countries like the U.S. and China running their GDP at ours at 122 uh, percent. Our debt to GDP ratio, China's, I think, is slightly higher than that. War is a debt instrument. I mean, you're going to get buried in debt if you go to war. Not a great idea. Yeah. Well, oh. we have the philosophy about debt that it's never going to be paid off. So what's the difference? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, speaking about that, so the computer and electronics sector, our number one industry sector, it's, it actually grew in percent contribution uh, in, in the calculation this year. It's, it's, I think it was 15 and a half or 16 percent. I think we're now 17 or 18. It actually grew. Uh, we were just short of 50 on that, 49.2, you know, up from 45.1. So, so as I mentioned, chemicals is getting better. Computers did a reverse, and I'd like to see it get above 50. I mean, the two of those are, you know, they're 30%, 30 plus percent of manufacturing GDP. That's that's very, very significant. So uh, that, that's a positive for sure. New order rates got better. Definitely uh, production was expansive. So 
So, so let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the output. Can we talk about the output? You may guess. Yeah, let's yeah, let's go through that a bit. Yeah. So we talked about the higher fire. Uh, you right. know, the production number was pretty flat at fifty, right? Fifty and some change. Fifty. 48 production came in at 48. So uh, about the same as last month, 48.6. So we're, we're coming down slowly. And, and I think, like I mentioned in December, it's, it's really managing the, uh, the manufacturing uh, absorption from the standpoint of, I only have so much backlog. Do I want to burn it all off in the month of February or March, or do I want to stretch it out till half two? Since if, if we've already decided that we're going to keep the people, uh, you know, Unless customers are really clamoring for something, then let's let's manage our output consistent with our headcount. So the suppliers are no longer really an issue. There's some chip issues here and there, but the supply base is not holding them back. So why are they contracting? There's there's still enough in the order books to expand. Well, I, I think they're trying to stretch out the, the work because they're not going to let the people go. It all kind of fits together. And and we'll see. I mean, we had a seasonal adjustment factors in December were pretty strong. They were still strong in January, uh, especially on the production side. On the new orders, I don't know if I mentioned this, but new orders, this December, the, there was a markup uh, on the SAFs that really stepped the new order number up. It was about half of that in January. So if you if you took the, the SAFs out, we were pretty consistent December and January with new order levels. Tim, uh, we've just got a minute or so left. I would like to get uh, some input from you on what the, the uh, seasonal adjustment factors are. I noticed that the ISM put out a notice on that. I just want you to share that with our audience. So we use a well-known st statistical analysis model to look at the prior 12 months and uh, and figure out what seasonal effects impacted output. Because you know we want to, if everything is stable through the whole year, month to month, we want a 50. But it's not that way because you have holidays, you got vacations, uh, you know, and, and you have less work days. So how do you adjust for that? Well, we have this analysis that, that puts a factor on new orders, production, uh, employment, and uh, inventory. Those are the four that we adjust. And when we'll, in the month of January, we take the last 12 months, we do the calculation, and then we go and we restate it back two years. So if you look at the PMI number for October and November, it may not be the same that we reported. Uh, so we only we only adjust it once a year to reflect the, the current seasonal adjustment factors. So it's a uh, you know we work with with people like this and and they are what they are. I mean I, you could argue that in the last couple of years there hasn't been any seasonality because everybody has been working working working. But you know the fact is there's some. So in, in every every month every year they they change. The other thing that that occurs in the month of January is we we calculate. Our, our PMI number based on the percent contribution of each industry sectors. You've heard me talk about, you know, the big six, uh, just talked about chemicals and computers. Those are, you know, number, number two and number one. So we do do a, re we don't do a restatement. We look at what the, what the prior period was in terms of the, the 18 industry sectors and we use them going forward. So the number I just showed you in contraction uses the current numbers in January against the uh, the performance numbers back to September. So it's a true indication of, of what's been happening. So, we're, you know, we're not mixing them up. We're, we're trying to be consistent with, with you know, the latest measurement. So industry sectors, so, you know, if, chem if chemicals is 15%, it weighs 15% into the PMI calculation, employment calculation, all of those. Great. Tim, thanks for being with us. We appreciate the ISM and you taking the time to, to share with our listeners. Okay, guys. Hey, thanks for having me. Look forward to speaking with you next month. We'll see what February brings. You bet. We'll put our money yes, on indeed. it now. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on this live broadcast of Manufacturing Talk Radio. I'd like to mention one thing before we say goodbye. And I think I mentioned it once before that we are in the process of becoming syndicated on uh, AM, FM radio nationwide. Uh, it's a slow process, but the last 10 years have been a slow process. So I figured I got another 10 years to fully become syndicated coast to coast. And uh, we'll see you all in the in the radio. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks a lot. 
appreciate it. See you next time.